after being rocked the hardest by the UK vote to leave the EU, the banking sector is rebounding this morning, leading the rally in European markets. Joining me right now is UBS Americas and Wealth Management Americas President Tom Naratel. Tom, it's great to see you. Thank you great so much for joining us. You know, as the head of a major uh, financial firm, UBS, in America, you obviously have been right there, front seat in terms of the implications to the finance sector as a result of Brexit. So what are the implications of Britain exiting the EU from your standpoint? So first, I mean, obviously there, there are a couple different implications. The first one is on business models. And the question is, you know, what will banks do that have had locations in London that they've been using to passport into the rest of the EU? And it's a little bit too early to make any determinations on that. That'll take some time as the negotiation on how the UK exits actually is, is completed. But the secondary effects, and that's what you're really seeing coming through in the stocks, are prospects of further central bank either easing or not tightening as quickly as people have modeled in. That compresses net interest income and as a result, you know, defers some of the dividend rebounds that some investors have been ex in expecting in the bank. You know, it's just extraordinary when we, when we look at central banks today and whether or not they're going to continue the stimulus. There's a real debate going on about whether or not they actually have the wherewithal to do so. Do they actually have the tools in the toolkit? What are you seeing from investors today in terms of sentiment? Uh, and what they feel, whether it's central bank or a market that was extended going into Brexit. Well, you've had you've had almost a series of rolling spectator events from investors. The the first has been, as you mentioned, Maria, uh, waiting and watching on the Fed every single meeting, and so investors pause, wait, wait for the activity, and then prepare to move. Next, you had the Brexit vote which was the next spectator sport. And we did see a pickup in activity uh, following, uh, following the vote itself. Uh, at the same time, we also saw a little bit of cash getting put to work as people had, had held back on some of the investment decisions that they were making. Yeah. Uh, but your next spectator sport for investors is going to come in the form of the U.S. election. And so you're likely to see activity slow down again, moving into uh, the rest of the summer and then into November. All right, so this is just a cycle that you've seen before. So you've had Fed Watch, you've had Brexit Watch, and now you'll have Election Watch. But, but, but where are we in terms of the cycle for financial services? I mean, we're coming off of a period where every firm on the street has cut jobs on the trading desk. Obviously, we know the fixed income really saw the axe, uh, equities as well. Are you done deleveraging at UBS? So we, we moved earlier than, uh, than a lot of our competitors. We started our strategic changes in our investment bank over five years ago. So for us, you know, we're largely done. When you take a look, though, at the industry as a whole, the next big move, you know, you're at a, you're at a point where normally in the cycle you'd be doing M&A. But regulators don't look too kindly on big-scale transitional M&A right. uh, anymore. But what you're likely to see is people starting to look at utilities. How can the industry form utilities for the back office or for their middle offices to gain economies of scale through that? So you're likely to see competitors cooperate in order to get to the point where they can make themselves, uh, put themselves in a position to deal with some of the cycle effects. So are we, are, so then we're, it sounds like we're not done then with the job cuts in terms of an industry, I'd say on an we're, we're, not, we're not done yet in terms of squeezing out all the efficiencies that we could in the back and middle office. Let me ask you about capital. Obviously this is a major issue for the industry. Uh, big question for UBS is whether the bank is now in line with the Swiss National Bank capital requirements. We're going to hear from the Federal Reserve later this week in terms of the stress tests. How confident are you in terms of capital in terms of the health of the bank right now? Extremely confident. We had, uh, as part of our, our strategic moves we made five years ago, we set for ourselves an internal capital target of a 13% CET1 ratio, mm -hmm. which is a 300 basis point premium to the, the Swiss requirements at the time. Since then, there's been a new, there was the too big to fail law in Switzerland, and then they passed what was called too big to fail two. Too big to fail too, we can meet uh, the rest of those requirements largely just by issuing AT1 and some other hybrid instruments over the course of the next couple of years. It's pretty extraordinary when you come up with, when, you, when we talk about all of this rulemaking because the, the, service, the financial services industry has just gotten feed to death and regulation to death. Was that a fair statement? Yeah, look, I, I, certainly some of the regulation that came out of the financial crisis was necessary and has certainly helped to make the financial system far, far more safe and far more secure than it was in the past. 
I would say the pendulum's probably swung a little bit too far yeah. uh, to one side. As it often and, does. And you know, you'd hope to see some moderation after we make our way out of the, uh, out of the election. And, and, and really the jewel of the business, or one of the jewels of the business, is wealth management. We know that. Big news at UBS Wealth Management, uh, Americas. You've recently introduced a new operating ma model, which I want to hear about. You've got $2 trillion in overall global AUM, more than a $1 trillion in assets under management in the U.S. Uh, alone. Talk to us about your changes in the wealth management business. Sure. The big focus for us, I mean, what really differentiates us from our U.S. competitors uh, with uh, about 7,000 advisors, but a trillion in assets under management, we've got the most productive advisor force in the industry. And we wouldn't trade our advisor force for any one of our competitors. We've got the opportunity to feel small. Uh, we're about half the size of our three largest competitors. At the same time, we can also play big. And the, the play big uh, aspect of that comes out with what we've seen over the course, certainly, of the past week. Uh, with $2 trillion in assets globally, we've got research analysts who are dedicated to wealth management, product specialists dedicated to wealth management around the globe. And where you're in a world where you need to follow the sun in order to understand what you need to do with your clients' uh, investment dollars, it's absolutely the right place to be at, uh, at UBS for our clients because we've got the best insight and the best set of products and services. Oh, uh, look, I know that. I remember speaking with Axel Weber, your chairman, a long time ago when you guys were really first to focus on wealth management as really a driver for the business. But let's fake it, face it, today you've got lots of people nipping at your nails, right? You've got, uh, with just about every bank in the world, building or rebuilding their wealth and asset management divisions. How do you maintain your lead? How do you maintain the margins when you've got all this competition hoping they could take your clients? Yeah, certainly. So, Maria, with wealth management uh, as a business has really low barriers to entry to be a small wealth manager but really high barriers to entry to be someone that's got a trillion in, in assets under management. So we've got the ability to leverage the scale across the globe and at the same time take advantage of being very focused, very boutique -y, feeling um, more empowered and more entrepreneurial here in the U.S. So as, as a, uh, the head of a major wealth management company, you see a market that's up 200 points today, and I recognize you're running the business. You're not over there picking stocks. But when, when you speak to clients, would it be okay today to put their, their toe in the water? Would you advise clients to actually buy equities today? So what we've, what we've been telling our clients, Maria, and what we actually saw the course of the past couple of days, our clients had cash available and they utilize it on pullbacks to take positions. And that's more likely to be the type of thing that we'd recommend them to take the opportunity to rebalance their portfolios on some of the more extreme moves that they, that they see in the markets. But, I, but I'd emphasize, uh, our biggest overweight is on the U.S. equity market. We feel that um, GDP in the U.S. is in good shape. We feel that you've got a Fed that although they're likely to move at some point, they're still relatively accommodative. And if we look at uh, the first quarter of 16, we feel like profits troughed in that mm, quarter, okay. and we're likely to see profits increasing. Uh, so as I wrap up here, you're not worried about a global recession then, or, or a U.S. recession. Let me say U.S. recession, because some people are questioning how an export-driven country like Switzerland can avoid a recession given the strength of the currency and the weakening European market. Sure. It's certainly going to be challenging for those in Europe and, and uh, with Switzerland sitting in the center. Right. Uh, they'll certainly have a few challenges. But at the same time, we think Asia and the U.S. are going to pull the rest of the world forward. All right. We will leave it there.